Theories of evolution attempt to study how life diverged from a common ancestor spread over the Earth. However, contrary to much of popular thought, evolution doesn't demonstrate, but rather assumes the origin of life. Natural selection can only act once a living organism already exists. But then, how did life begin? Is there a naturalistic explanation? This video will assess various theories of life's origin and argue that they all fail. Life, and more specifically the DNA that is required for life, is best explained by an intelligent being rather than a materialistic natural process. It is time to explore the origin of life. Since the mid-20th century, we've known that life is based on DNA. DNA is what sequences the proteins that build living organisms. DNA is a type of information, and it is this information that is crucial for the creation of life. Since DNA is a form of information, the question of life's origin is equivalent to what is the origin of information in DNA. The fact that life is based on information is a major difficulty for all materialistic accounts of life because information is immaterial. Although information does require a material medium, it transcends its material medium. Since the same information can be transmitted through a variety of physical mediums, information is clearly not reducible to matter. Consider the example of a disk. A blank disk weighs just as much as one containing sophisticated software, yet the blank disk gives no function and the disk containing software does because of the digital information written by a programmer. But since there is no material difference between either disk, the information is not reducible to the matter comprising the disk. So what exactly is information? Information, as it is being understood here, can be defined as alternative sequences or arrangements of something that produce a specific function. As we probe the question of life's origin, we must keep in mind that we are pursuing a question about the past. As such, we must adopt the principles of forensic science. In forensic science, one makes an inference to the best explanation as a hypothesis for the cause of a past event after assessing competing possible causes. Which explanation can be considered the best? It comes down to the question of which hypothesis has the causal adequacy to produce the effect. When there is only one known answer to this question, then that explanation, of necessity, becomes the best explanation. We can therefore summarize the criteria for the best explanation as being a cause now in operation that is known to produce the effect in question. So what cause that is currently in operation is known to produce information? There is only one known source of information, and that is intelligence. Think of all the types of information we encounter, whether it is text in a book, or computer code, or hieroglyphics. When we encounter information and trace it back to its source, we always come to an intelligent mind. Therefore we know that intelligence has the causal adequacy to explain the origin of life. Stephen Meyer argues, since the intelligent design hypothesis meets both the causal adequacy and causal existence criteria of the best explanation, and since no other competing explanation meets those conditions as well or at all, it follows that the design hypothesis provides the best, most causally adequate explanation of the origin of the information necessary to produce the first life on Earth. So the discovery of the specified digital information in the DNA molecule provides strong grounds for inferring that intelligence played a role in the origin of DNA. Clearly, if Meyer is right that only intelligence is known to produce information, then intelligent design becomes the best explanation for the origin of life. The question is, are there any other viable candidate hypotheses? Many have been offered, and it is to these theories that we now turn. Some have argued that the Miller-Urey experiment solves the problem of life's origin, or at least gives us reason to believe that the answer is just around the corner. In the early 1950s, Stanley Miller filled a glass apparatus with methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and water, which he believed represented the conditions on the early Earth. He then sparked it to simulate lightning. The experiment yielded amino acids, the building blocks of life. However, there are numerous acknowledged problems with this experiment, which casts doubt on it having any relevance to modern origin of life studies. For one thing, Miller assumed that the early Earth didn't have oxygen in its atmosphere, which is now known to be false. Additionally, the hydrogen Miller used in his experiment would have realistically escaped from the Earth's atmosphere. 
So Miller got the conditions of the early Earth completely wrong. Experiments repeated under realistic conditions yield no amino acids. This has led Jonathan Wells to say, The conclusion is clear. If the Miller-Urey experiment is repeated using a realistic simulation of the Earth's primitive atmosphere, it doesn't work. Therefore, origin of life researchers have had to look elsewhere. Second, the experiment yielded only some of the amino acids necessary for life, but not all. Third, these amino acids were found in a brownish mixture containing substances that would have been harmful to the formation of life. In short, the Miller-Urey experiment is based on flawed assumptions and has given us no reason to believe life arose from natural processes. Perhaps the most popular hypothesis to solve the DNA enigma is the RNA world hypothesis. According to this view, it is too difficult to get DNA directly from natural processes, so it postulates the RNA arose first, which in turn gave rise to DNA. This seems plausible to some because RNA is simpler than DNA, yet it can perform many of the functions that DNA performs. Hence, RNA first seems more likely than DNA first. Nonetheless, this theory is beset with problems. First, RNA building blocks are difficult to synthesize and easy to destroy. Before RNA could have ever formed, several smaller constituent molecules would have had to form. But it is nearly impossible for these building blocks to be synthesized and maintained under realistic prebiotic conditions. And experiments that successfully achieve this synthesis have succeeded due to intelligent interference on the part of scientists. Second, ribozymes are poor substitutes for proteins. RNA molecules possess very few of the enzymatic properties of a protein. Ribozymes can only perform a small number of the functions that proteins can. RNA simply lacks the tools to fully do what DNA does. Third, an RNA-based translation and coding system is implausible. In order for RNA to lead to DNA, at some point RNA would have had to produce proteins. Since it is proteins that build other proteins, RNA would have had to develop a coding and translation system based only on RNA, while still generating the necessary information to build proteins. This doesn't seem plausible. Fourth, the RNA world doesn't explain the origin of the genetic information. Even if advocates of the RNA first model are correct, they presuppose the existence of the information in RNA. They don't explain it. The origin of self-replicating RNA depends on information, and in order to transition to a protein-based system, the RNA would have had to produce over 100 different proteins, each of which would require even more genetic information. Thus, despite its popularity, there is no compelling reason to consider the RNA world hypothesis a likely candidate for explaining the origin of life. Stephen Meyer says, the central problem facing origin of life researchers is neither the synthesis of prebiotic building blocks or even the synthesis of self-replicating RNA molecules. Instead, the fundamental problem is getting the chemical building blocks to arrange themselves into large information-bearing molecules. Even the extremely limited capacity for RNA self-replication that has been demonstrated depends critically on the specificity of the arrangements of nucleotide bases that is, upon pre-existing, sequence-specific information. Still others have suggested that self-organization solves the problem of life's origin. According to self-organization theories, the constituent parts of DNA have bonding affinities between them, which can cause DNA to assemble by itself. Although intriguing, such theories are currently without empirical data. They are largely theoretical. However, there is a good reason to believe that self-organization will never explain the information in DNA. Although it is quite true that there are chemical bonds fixing the individual nucleotide bases to the backbones of the molecule, there are no chemical bonds between the bases themselves along the axis in the center of the helix. In other words, the nucleotides can be placed anywhere along the backbone of the DNA helix. There is no chemical bond that determines the specific arrangement of the nucleotide bases. Since it is along this axis of the DNA molecule that the genetic information is stored, it is almost certain that the arrangement of the DNA nucleotides will never be explained by reference to chemical bonding affinities. Additionally, since natural laws explain highly regular and predictable patterns, they are the wrong sort of entity to explain the information in DNA. Since information is, by its very nature, irregular and unpredictable, 
Stephen Meyer sums this up by saying, Self-organizational forces of chemical necessity, which produce redundant order and preclude complexity, preclude the generation of specified complexity, or specified information as well, law-like chemical forces do not generate complex sequences. Thus, they cannot be invoked to explain the origin of information, whether specified or otherwise. Although some still express optimism about a naturalistic explanation for the origin of life, organic synthetic chemist James Tor tells the grim truth about the current state of origin of life research. The simplest bacterium with its 256 protein coding genes, we have no idea how to build it. First of all, we don't know how to build the molecules, the four classes of molecules that are needed for it. We don't know how to, even if we had those four classes of molecules, assemble them even into a, the simplest of bacteriums. We don't know how to do that. One can do that with the technologies we have today. We can make technologies, but we can't even make the simplest bacterium. Anybody who would say con something contrary does not know what they are talking about. Show me the demonstration. Nobody has ever done it. And it's not because of lack of, of, of effort. It's not because of lack of will. First of all, they haven't been able to get the molecules to do this. And if they could make the molecules, even if we were to give them the molecules, they wouldn't have the information. There would be no inherent information in the DNA. But even if we gave them the DNA in the structure that they wanted, they wouldn't know how to put all the components together because of the sophistication within a cell. The interactomes, meaning that the interacting connectivity between the molecules, the van der Waals interactions, all of these have to be in the right place and in the right order for a cell to function. We don't even know how to define life, let alone knowing how to spark it to begin. There is a very real chicken and egg problem with explaining the origin of life naturalistically. The DNA molecule is built by biological machines. The problem is that the information for building these machines is stored in the DNA molecule. You can't get new DNA without machinery, and you can't get machinery without pre-existing DNA. To appreciate this problem, consider an analogy of a DVD and a DVD player. What if the instructions for building the first DVD player were only found encoded on a DVD? You could never play the DVD to learn how to build a DVD player. So how did the first disc and DVD player system arise? The answer is obvious. A goal-directed process, intelligent design, is required to produce the player and the disc at the same time. Some critics of this argument for intelligent design deny the obvious. They claim that DNA is not really information, and that intelligent design proponents get carried away by a term that is simply convenient. According to them, information is just a metaphor to describe what DNA does. However, this is simply not true. DNA is, in a very rigorous sense, information, and this is revealed by an objective definition of the word information. Remember, information is defined as alternative sequences or arrangements of something that produces a specific effect. DNA fits this definition perfectly, for it is the specific sequence or arrangement of nucleotide bases that gives rise to the specific functions in an organism. Meyer reminds us that only where information connotes subjective meaning does it function as a metaphor in biology. Where it refers to complex functional specificity, it defines a feature of living systems that calls for explanation every bit as much as, say, a mysterious set of inscriptions on the inside of a cave. As we have seen, there are currently no known materialistic explanations for the origin of the information of DNA. Since information, by nature, is not reducible to matter, it seems highly unlikely, if not impossible, that its origin will ever be explained by reference to materialistic processes. However, common experience bears witness to the fact that intelligence can, and does, explain the origin of information. Since intelligence is the only known cause now in operation that produces information, intelligence is the best explanation for the origin of the information in the DNA molecule. This provides a serious challenge to materialism and gives us good reason to consider the possibility of God's existence.